Hello and welcome to the first in the series of the Case Closed. Uh, today we'll be looking at paediatrics, foreign body in the left eye. Attendance School Science Fair, Claire, age 12, was watching an experiment in which a penny was struck by a hammer. At the time of impact, something flew off and hit Claire in the eye. She told her mother what had happened and her mother immediately rinsed her eye with water. Her eye was red and watering, but she did not complain of pain, so they continued to enjoy the science fair. The next morning, Claire stayed home from school and around 11.45 a.m., her mother called the paediatrician's office. An LPN in the office spoke with the paediatrician, Dr. Jones, about the phone call from Claire's mother. It was a busy day and the paediatrician's first thought was to refer Claire to an emergency department. However, there was a time in the schedule later that day, so an appointment was scheduled. The LPN called Claire's mother and confirmed the appointment. The LPN documented her conversation with Claire's mother, including the statement that Claire continued to deny any pain, but was constantly rubbing her eye and continued to have sensitivity to light. The LPN instructed her mother to call the office again if Claire developed further signs or if her symptoms worsened. Claire was seen in the late afternoon by Dr. Jones, who documented the history of a piece of copper scratching her left eye that morning. She was complaining of tearing and blurred vision, but denied pain. She was holding a towel over her eye, but did not, be, not appear to be in acute distress. Upon examination with an ophthalmoscope, Dr. Jones found her pupils to be equal, round and reactive to light and accommodation. The left eye was red and tearing. Her visual acuity was 20-20 in the right eye, but she stated she could not see the letters with her left eye. A fluorescent dye test was completed on the left eye and a black light. Dr. Jones could not identify any evidence of abrasion or other injury. Out of concern about the redness and poor vision in the left eye, Dr. Jones contacted an ophthalmologist, Dr. Smith, who she had previously consulted. She conveyed the pertinent medical information, including the fact that Claire's vision in her left eye was significantly diminished. Dr. Smith advised her to treat the eye as a corneal abrasion with antibiotic drops. Dr. Jones's notes clearly indicated that Dr. Smith advised that if Claire's vision continued to be blurry the next day, she should be taken to a local emergency room. Dr. Jones passed these instructions to Claire's mother. She gave the mother a prescription for antibiotic drops with instructions to administer two drops daily for seven days. Claire was to return to the office in one week, but Dr. Jones indicated in her note that she would call the family in four days to see how the patient was doing. The following Monday, three days later, Claire's mother scheduled an appointment with her own ophthalmologist who ordered a scan. It revealed a foreign body, apparently copper, in the vitreous of her left eye, which was severely inf infected. On Tuesday, the following day, Dr. Jones received a telephone call from the family ophthalmologist who saw Claire on Monday, and he reported the, find the CT findings to her. Dr. Jones called and spoke with Claire's mother that evening. Her mother told, told her Claire was referred to a retinal specialist and undergone surgery. The retinal specialist had performed a vitrectomy to remove the foreign body, as well as a keratectomy. Claire's visual problems did not resolve and she underwent a corneal transplant with intraocular lens insertion in the left eye. Initially, she did well, but never regained any significant vision in her left eye. Claire developed glaucoma in the left eye and the transplanted cornea had significant clouding. Despite other procedures, Claire continued to have problems with glaucoma. Her prognosis for recovering useful video in her left eye was guarded. A suit was filed against the paediatrician, the paediatrician's group, and the informal consultant, on-call ophthalmologist in this case. Uh, we will be examining this case uh, from three aspects. Uh, the first, the medical perspective, uh, presented by Dr. James F. Conn III, uh, paediatrician, MICA president, and CEO. Uh, prior to joining MICA in 1997, Dr. Carlin practiced paediatrics in the East Valley. He founded East Valley Children's Center and helped establish Desert Physician Association, a multi-specialty IPA in the East Valley. While in practice, he provided expert witness testimony in a number of medical professional liability actions. Dr. Collins. It is unfortunate that nothing was done at the time of the injury, but it is understandable. Claire had no pain, scratchiness, or complaint of discomfort immediately following the injury, and apparently no visual complaint either. She only had redness and tearing as a physical finding, but she did have something in her history that was determinative. She had something that hit her eye, presumably at a high velocity, 
because it happened in connection with a hammer striking a penny. Her mother did not know why that was significant, and apparently neither did the pediatrician. The pediatrician's history the following day describes a scratch from a piece of copper, a description that sent the pediatrician down the path of an incorrect algorithm. Unfortunately, the error was compounded by the failure to recognize that blurred vision does not result from a scratch of the cornea. It was appropriate that the pediatrician initially discuss the problem with an ophthalmologist. Unfortunately, she apparently conveyed the mechanism of injury as a scratch, as stated in her notes, not a potentially high-velocity piece of copper. However, she did note that the left eye visual acuity was profoundly diminished. The loss of vision should have resulted in immediate referral and treatment. Regardless of the presence or absence of pain, the presence or absence of a corneal abrasion on examination, the presence or absence of a normal pupillary response, this child had a loss of vision in her left eye following trauma. That situation was no longer manageable by the pediatrician. She should have insisted on the ophthalmologist seeing the patient immediately, or failing that, should have sent the child to the emergency department for an emergent ophthalmological evaluation. The ophthalmologist, as the specialist, had the obligation to ask the right question, even if the pediatrician does not have enough medical background related to the eye to offer the information proactively. And the key question should have been, what is the vision in the affected eye? Trauma, high speed or low speed, though how a preteen could be poked with copper is a bit of a stretch, and the loss of visual acuity makes this an ophthalmologist problem. Lack of communication between two professionals complicated by poor documentation will make this difficult for a jury to sort out the perception that the pediatrician did not know enough medicine to properly get help in caring for this child or the ophthalmologist did not care enough to make arrangements to see the child immediately. Uh, thank you, Dr. Collins. Um, I have a question. Um, I've been told that most physicians, not only pediatricians, have a difficult time diagnosing eye conditions. Is this true? Uh, if so, do you think that it's uh, due to a lack of training or a lack of having the appropriate technology in their office? Uh, I think the training is quite good. I think it's a lack of technology. And some of the technology can be quite simple. A Snellen chart, for example, uh, can be utilized, but that requires a distance of 20 feet unless you're going to use mirrors. And about the only way that can be done in a typical pediatrician's office is in the hallway. Uh, pediatricians don't have a slit lamp, which would be extremely important in this type of uh, an evaluation. The training, I think, for a pediatrician comes down to recognizing mechanisms of injury and probable consequences, uh, and then arranging for appropriate referrals. Thank you, Dr. Colland. Uh, we now move on to the claims perspective, presented by Dave Winkler. Uh, Micah Claims Supervisor. Uh, Mr. Winkler has worked uh, in the Micah Claims Department since 1981, has been a claims supervisor since 1988. In addition, Mr. Winkler is responsible for the supervision of all Micah litigation involving the eyes. Documentation errors. During the pediatrician's deposition, both the ophthalmologist defense attorney and the plaintiff attorney focused their attention on the portion of her office note related to the history of the injury. In her note, the pediatrician mistakenly identified the event with the foreign body as occurring on the morning of the office visit. In fact, it had occurred the prior evening. She also described the mechanism of the injury as a scratch. She explained that she probably entered the note after Claire left the office and mistakenly entered the wrong time and mechanism of injury. She admitted the documented history was not as detailed as she would have liked. Incident report. The ophthalmologist prepared an incident report after the pediatrician informed him of the discovery of a foreign body on the CT scan. Some of the note was consistent with the pediatrician's progress note, but other portions were not. The ophthalmologist's incident report stated that the pediatrician told him that Claire was poked with copper and the eye injury was low speed. He also suggested that he told the pediatrician he was on call at the local children's hospital that night and he was available to see Claire in the emergency department. Finger pointing. Finger pointing between the defendants made the chance of a defense verdict at trial unlikely for either doctor. The ophthalmologist testified that he understood from the pediatrician that the injury had just occurred. If he had known it had occurred almost 24 hours before, he would have recommended immediate follow-up. 
The ophthalmologist further testified that he absolutely did not advise the pediatrician to treat the injury as a corneal abrasion. He also implied that he told the pediatrician he was on call at a local children's hospital that evening and would see Claire in the emergency department. The pediatrician testified that she was not certain she had told the ophthalmologist that Claire's left eye was very red, but she was not complaining of pain. She also told him at least twice that Claire could not see the letters with her left eye during the vision exam. The pediatrician could not recall whether the ophthalmologist inquired whether the injury was low speed or high speed. But if he did ask, she would have repeated what she understood, which was that Claire was hit in the eye with something while watching a demonstration of a boy hammering a penny. Finally, the pediatrician testified that if the ophthalmologist informed her that he would be available to see Claire that evening in the Children's Hospital Emergency Department, she would have absolutely instructed the mother to take Claire to see him. Plaintiff had an intuitive argument. Plaintiff's expert testified that a sudden loss of vision is an emergent problem that must be seen by an ophthalmologist ASAP. While the defense had support for the argument that you must evaluate each situation independently and make a judgment call, it is hard for a lay person to understand that you don't need to be seen by an ophthalmologist if you are suffering vision loss. The pediatrician missed the fragment on exam. The defense had to acknowledge that the metal fragment was present, but argued that it is within the standard of care to miss it. Furthermore, no abrasion could be identified, but antibiotics were still prescribed. If the pediatrician prescribed antibiotics as a precaution, why not simply refer the child to an ophthalmologist as a precaution? Future damages. While plaintiff's claims for future medical expenses and lost wages were highly speculative, the patient's youth and the effects of inflation over time allowed plaintiff to project some large numbers for future economic damages. Thank you, Dave. Uh, just, uh, just a question for you. Do you feel the settlement for this case would have been different for an adult as opposed to a child? Um, if so, uh, you know, what factors do you consider when determining the value of this case? It probably would have been different. The value of an eye injury to a child in general is likely greater than the value of the same injury in an adult. A child will have many more years to live with the injury, and the plaintiff attorney may attempt to blackboard a large lost wage claim by asserting that certain occupations will be off limits due to the eye injury. Also, the sympathy factor is likely to be much higher for a child than for an adult. Other factors include the loss of enjoyment of life, that is to say, activities that may be limited by vision loss, such as sports, hobbies, crafts, etc., future medical expenses, and perhaps most importantly, the quality of vision in the remaining eye. Fortunately, bilateral vision loss cases are rare, but their value is exponentially higher. Thanks, Dave. Uh, now we move on to the risk management perspective uh, presented by Julie Ritzman, who's the MICA VP of Risk Management. Uh, Ms. Ritzman has worked at MICA since 2014. Prior to joining MICA, she was a risk manager for St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center in Phoenix. Before moving to Arizona, she was also the risk manager for the employed physicians for a large health system in Midwest, consisting of a 400 physician base. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, there are just two basic pieces of risk management that I'd like to talk about, and um, a lot of these were covered by both Dr. Carlin and Mr. Winkler, so I'll be brief. But the first and foremost was um, an informal consult. Informal consult versus referring Claire to the emergency department. The pediatrician chose to get an informal consult instead of sending the patient to an emergency department. In hindsight, the pediatrician regretted not referring Claire to the emergency department. While an informal or curbside consultations are relatively common, they can have questionable benefit and significant risks. The physician who is being consulted lacks the opportunity to complete an independent examination, leaving him or her to form an opinion which is only as complete as the information that was provided by the physician. The physician requesting the consult will have no written response to rely upon while incorporating the recommendations into the patient's plan of care. From a risk perspective, the advice given is basically this. If you feel you need to make a phone call or request a consult, then you should really just request the consult. Or in this situation, when the specialty physician stated that he would be willing and was on call to see the patient in the emergency room, she should have just sent Claire to the emergency room. The second piece that I wanted to talk about is unclear instructions and or unclear documentation. The unclear instructions were to the mother. Claire's mother recalled that the pediatrician instructed her to take Claire to the emergency room if her eye got worse, not if it remained the same. 
The pediatrician clearly recalled telling Claire's mother to take her to the emergency room if her vision remained blurry the next day. However, this was not documented in the record. One of the things that this case provides is a good example of how simple errors in the documentation can have lasting consequences. You know, physicians often express to the risk management team the concern that reviewing dictated notes or documentation generated through a voice recognition system for accuracy takes too much time and they're already busy in their schedule. I think this case should demonstrate why taking those additional minutes or seconds might actually be a time saver. And so that would be our risk management advice is that although it does take a few extra minutes or seconds to review that documentation, maybe it would have been caught that she stated that it was in the morning when the injury occurred as opposed to in the evening. The next thing I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about a couple of um, slides that we have specifically to pediatrics. And this comes from the PIAA, which is the Physician Insurance Association of America. These are national graphs submitted by all of the members of which MICA is one of those members. But this first graph demonstrates the total number of closed claims by um, the healthcare specialty that has been submitted nationally to PIAA. As you will see, pediatrics falls right in the middle of the pack with 2,000 claims. And you'll happen to notice at the top that this is from 2004 to 2013. And although pediatrics falls in the middle, the specialty with the highest number of claims is internal medicine with just about 14,000 claims. The specialty with the lowest, which actually appears to be almost zero, is both oral surgery as well as resident slash interns with no claims being filed. The next graph demonstrates the paid to closed ratio in which pediatrics is equal with the average of all healthcare specialties at 26.3%. As you can see, dentists have the highest rate with 53.5% and psychiatry with the lowest rate at 15.4%. For the national indemnity, pediatrics falls third at 399,000, outranked only by neurology at 419,000, ob gyn surgery at 422,000 and neurosurgery with 448,000. And I think Mr. Winkler actually described the reason why that might be given the age of the patients that are submitting the claims. When looking at the largest indemnity um, payments across the specialties, pediatrics is on the upper end at seventh with 5.3 million. However, if you take a look at the top three, ob gyn internal medicine and otorhino Laryngology, that's a mouthful, um, are more than double that value with 13, 12, and 11 point million respectively. As you have noticed, the, gla the graphs at this point have included data from 2004 to 2013. However, these next graphs, we're actually going to switch the time frame to 2009 to 2013 data. This first graph shows that during the time frame, PIAA has seen 993 claims against pediatricians. Of those, the resolution has been divided by 63.3 dropped, withdrawn, or dismissed, 21.6% were settled, 7.6% defendant verdicts, 0.7% only for plaintiff verdicts, 1.7% ADR or contract, and 0.6% were not specified. Um, you'll also notice that the defense expenses have increased by 31.8%. This demonstrates an increase in the dollar value from 46,581 to now 61,385 on average to defend a claim. And with the last graph I have included that shows Although the defense costs have increased during that same time period, the indemnity has actually decreased. It went from 459,872 to 421,326. So just as a recap, although the indemnity has gone down, the defense uh, the, or the cost in order to defend the claim has actually gone up. 29% of all those claims ended up with an indemnity payment. And from those 993 claims, the top chief medical factors or what triggered the claim were errors in diagnosis, improper performance, which I think we saw both of those in these, this case, no medical misadventure. And what that means is that the pediatrician actually had little, little or no involvement in the case. 
So in this particular case, what you might have seen is if the pediatrician had received a telephone call from Claire's mother and just sent, simply sent Claire on to the emergency room, the pediatrician may still have been named in the case. And that um, particular, because she was named in the case, it would have fallen into the no medical misadventure because she really had nothing to do with the case. But Claire may still have had a negative outcome in which a suit may have been filed. And then the last two were failure to supervise or monitor the case, and number five was medication errors. Of note, the most expensive medical factor noted in pediatric claims was also errors in diagnosis, which accounted for more than 66.7 million of indemnity paid, 58% of the total indemnity paid for all pediatric claims. The TAP outcomes, or the medical con condition that occurred resulting in the claim for pediatricians, was cardiac or cardiorespiratory arrest, brain damaged infant, emotional distress only, encephalopathy, and meningitis. That concludes our presentation for today on pediatrics, foreign body, left eye. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for their perspective, uh, Dr. James Carland, uh, Mr. Dave Wingler, and Ms. Julie Ritzman. Please join us for our next presentation.